Thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you for the invitation to this very nice uh, meeting. And thank you all for staying so long with us. Uh, my topic is uh, prognosis, diagnosis, and treatment of uh, so-called true ED and prefibrotic myelofibrosis. So uh, the diagnosis of these two entities rely um, mostly on histopathology uh, criteria. And uh, this is a cartoon of a paper uh, produced uh, by Jürgen Diele um, using also our patient cohort where he tried to characterize uh, the, uh, a clearer picture um, of uh, the two entities. Most impressive, most important, the megakaryocyte nuclei, more stacorn-like in ET, more cloud-like in uh, prefibrotic myelofibrosis. There is a clustering of megakaryocytes in the bone marrow. Uh, clustering means more, at least more than three megakaryocytes side by side in comparison to uh, essential thrombocytemia and a higher cellularity. And uh, here in the prefibrotic myelofibrosis patients, a certain amount of fibers in comparison to essential thrombocytemia. These are uh, some of the hallmarks. Here in the reality, you see the stacorn like megakaryocyte nuclei, and here you see uh, the clustering of megakaryocytes in uh, early prefibrotic myelofibrosis with the more dense cloud like nuclei uh, of the megakaryocytes, uh, with here with less erythropoiesis and here more erythropoiesis in the case of WHO characterized essential thrombocytemia. And according to this uh, morphologic criteria, uh, there is a, a cartoon how to proceed with the differentiation uh, with uh, the histologic uh, picture, megakaryocyte clustering, cellularity, megakaryocyte lobulating, uh, and with this uh, tool, it's a little bit easier uh, for the pathologist uh, to distribute uh, or dis to distinguish between WH essential thrombocytemia and prefibrotic myelofibrosis. Doing it in this way, um, we uh, reclassified in, in Austria, not just in Vienna, uh, up to now more than 800 patients. And we had a picture of uh, a lot of polycythemia vera patients. Uh, we could just those uh, BV patients include who had bone marrow biopsy, because according to the uh, recent uh, criteria, uh, bone marrow biopsy is not mandatory in, in polycythemia vera. As we have heard from Professor Papui, this will change in the revised criteria of the WHO classification. On the other hand, we had about 27% of true ED patients and the cake of prefibrotic myelofibrosis patients is rather big in this cohort, about 17%. And all in all, these patients would have been classified according to the PVSG classification as essential thrombocytemia. These are the overt uh, primary myelofibrosis patients. And here the mixture between essential thrombocytemia and polycythemia vera, um, as we have heard before. What is uh, the importance of this classification for the overall survival, for the progress into fibrosis, and also for the thrombosis-free survival? When we uh, distribute, uh, or when we distinguish between WHO-ET and prefibrotic myelofibrosis, we have a clear uh, picture of a prolonged survival in WHO classified essential thrombocytemia, which is in our case 21.7 uh, years 
in comparison to prefibrotic myelofibrosis, which is 14.4 years. So essential thrombocytemia patients have uh, seven years longer overall survival in comparison to prefibrotic myelofibrosis patients. So there is a clear distinction of these two entities and uh, we can see the whole cohort um, um, of, the, um, of my institution, uh, which has been uh, reclassified so far. This is the essential thrombocytemia, this is the prefibrotic myelofibrosis, and interestingly, this survival overlaps with the PV patients. So, prefibrotic myelofibrosis patients have a very similar overall survival to polycythemia vera patients. Uh, and the worst survival of word primary myelofibrosis. And interestingly, this fits very well to the uh, Teferis uh, data, which have been published very recently. He had also about 13 point and something years, um, uh, no, no, uh, he had about 20 years overall survival, 18.6 uh, years overall survival, for essential thrombocytemia, uh, about 13 years for PV, very similar to our cohort, and a short, much shorter survival for overt uh, primary myelofibrosis patients. So we have here a very clear distinction. On the other hand, and this was also extremely important to show that calreticoline mutation, if it is present, has, uh, these patients have a very good prognosis and a subgroup which is AS6L1 negative has the best uh, prognosis and um, uh, in agreement uh, with uh, Professor Vanucci, um, the patients who are AS6L1 positive had uh, a worse prognosis in the case they did not have fecal reticulin mutation. And this analysis was done in low and intermediate risk BMF patients. So AS6L1 might add some information on prognosis in um, patients who have uh, good, uh, who belong to the good risk group. What is about uh, the comparison of uh, WHO classified essential thrombocytemia for example, with the British uh, ET classification. So uh, the British um, ET classification is mainly based on hematologic or clinic parameters and doesn't uh, count uh, the morphologic bone marrow morphologic criteria. In our cohort so far, 164 patients did fulfill the criteria for a British ET, and when we then looked at the WHO classification, we saw that only 55% of these patients fulfilled the criteria of the WHO classification, and 34% uh, uh, fulfilled the criteria for prefibrotic myelofibrosis patients. And as you heard again from uh, Professor Papui, we have a picture of masked PV, and the British ET is also hiding some patients, about 10% uh, with masked PV. PV. These are the patients the ET patients who transform to polycythemia vera after a longer observation period. These are the transformed uh, ETs to PV. Uh, if we uh, count also on the histopathologic uh, picture at the beginning, we would have been able to characterize these patients already at the time of diagnosis as masked PV. And this is uh, the fibrosis free survival of the British ET in comparison to WHO uh, classified ET. So we have a higher percentage of uh, transformation to fibrosis uh, uh, if we characterize our patients according to the British classification. And it's even worse, our, our patient number is very small concerning this, you are applying the PVSG classification. Okay, now uh, the risk for thrombosis, um, as you know, uh, the risk for thrombosis for essential thrombocytemia is uh, the age, certainly 
but the cardiovascular risk factor, previous thrombosis, and certainly the check 2 mutation, which has uh, the highest power in this analysis. And um, as we have uh, seen also, um, check 2 mutation is extremely important for the risk for thrombosis, and as, as soon as the patient is calreticulin positive, um, he or she has a lower risk for thrombotic events. What about the treatment of uh, these two entities? What do we want to achieve in, ess in essential thrombocytemia characterized according to the WHO classification? As we heard uh, before, certainly improvement of the risk of thrombosis, uh, which means in this uh, subset of patients, certainly besides um, uh, the normalization of general uh, cardiovascular risk factor, a normalization of the platelet count. And what we also would like to achieve is, because the essential thrombocytemia is a neoplastic disorder, we would like to have also some disease-modifying effect if this is possible. Um, so uh, we can achieve some disease-modifying effect uh, with compounds which are cytoreductive, which uh, may be uh, improve uh, the check 2 allelic burden, but such compounds are not uh, registered in this entity. Therefore, we have to rely on compounds which uh, lower the platelet counts or also lower the white blood cell counts. On one hand, it's hydroxyurea, and on the other hand, it's anacrylide. And anacrylide is also sufficient for treating these subsets of patients with WHO classified essential thrombocytemia. Anacrylide lowers as uh, hydroxyurea for platelet count, and we do not see an excess of thrombotic events uh, using only anacrylide, no hydroxyurea in these patients. So anacrylide was as active as hydroxyurea in essential thrombocytemia classified according to the WHO classification because these patients have not an increase of white blood cell counts. So it's not necessary to lower normal white blood cell counts in these uh, ET patients. Therefore, you don't need hydroxyurea. It's sufficient to use anacrylate. But it could be in future maybe interesting uh, to use some, something else, which is also, which has the potential to modify the disease, which could, for example, be interferon. And as you know, a lot of the ET patients are calreticulin positive. And here, the first investigations uh, which show that the calreticulin allelic burden is going down in patients during interferon treatment here and here in this uh, uh, two patients. So on the long uh, term treatment uh, in future, it could be interesting to think about interferon also in essential thrombocytemia. Uh, putting this together, these are the Oncopedia uh, guidelines, uh, which tell us that if we characterize our patients according to the WHO classification, um, we would say anacrylate is uh, sufficient for the long-term treatment without the risk of a long-term leukemogenic effect and as, as soon as anacrylate uh, is not active anymore, you can mainly in uh, elderly patients sw also switch to hydroxyurea. So far, uh, the situation in the WHO characterized essential thrombocytemia, but what about early PMF? In early PNF, PMF, it's a, let's say, a new entity. We don't have any guidelines so far. What is uh, my suggestion for the approach? The first thing is, if you don't have anything better, wait and see. If there is a lot of risk for thrombosis because of high white blood cell counts, uh, high platelet counts, hydroxyurea is certainly a choice. But you can also uh, combine these two, or there could be in future the options of interferon 
or maybe even ruxolitinib, but this is not investigated so far. Um, in general, we can say that uh, in this cohort, as shown in the PD-1 study, I consider the pvsg ed as early myelofibrosis patients rather than essential thrombocytemia. And as we have seen and as we know, in these patients, anacrylide is not a very good choice if you use it just as monotherapy. Hydroxuria is better. So if you use anacrylide in this subset of patients, you have to combine it with something cytoreductive, which also reduces the white blood cell counts, not just the platelet counts. But uh, there is also the possibility of interferon treatment, and this is one of the first studies uh, in such a setting. They could show that, for example, the spleen size goes down in about 40% of the patients. White blood cell count re react very sensitive, as well as platelet counts uh, to interferon. So interferon could be a very uh, good uh, cho choice also for these patients. As uh, we know also that there is a lot of reduction of the check 2 allelic burden in these patients. Uh, this reminds um, to uh, the spleen shrinkage during the um, check 2 inhibitor therapy. So uh, interferon alpha could be an ideal uh, drug for avoiding thromboembolic events and achieving also a disease-modifying effect in these patients. So it's worth to investigate interferon alpha in this subset of patients. Okay, and this is already my conclusion for the primary myelofibrosis. Uh, it's according to a very recent uh, update of the approach for myelofibrosis, and I will just focus on this. Um, so, in, uh, uh, in general, we can say early prefibrotic myelofibrosis patients without symptoms, without any excess of the risk for thrombotic events, you should only observe if there is an excess of thrombosis risk, cytoreductive therapy, and in case of symptoms, um, mainly also in, uh, on the background of a slightly enlarged spleen size, um, uh, ruxolitinib could be a choice uh, for treatment of these patients. And I would encourage you to think about uh, clinical studies uh, using interferon in this uh, subset of patients. With this, I thank you for your attention, and as last speaker, in six weeks, I would be happy if we could see each other in Vienna during the EHA. Thank you for your attention.